Welcome to Success in Brief. I'm your host, Roseanne Filicello. In every episode, we spotlight successful women in the law. We discuss with them their journey to success. We talk about the difficulties and the trade-offs, along with the highlights and the benefits, and about what success means to each of them. We hope to inspire you with these stories on your own path to success. Hello, my name is Roseanne Filicello, and this is Success in Brief. I'm thrilled today to welcome Corey Stoughton to the podcast. Welcome. Thanks, Roseanne. For the past three years, Corey has served as the attorney in charge special litigation at the Legal Aid Society in New York City. Prior to that position, she served as the advocacy director and then acting executive director at Liberty, the UK's preeminent domestic human rights organization. She served as a senior counsel at the DOJ under President Obama, and she spent over 10 years as an attorney at New York Civil Liberties Union. You may have also heard or seen Corey's name in the news recently, as she was named on the short list of nominees to serve as chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals, um, which is the seven-judge court, that's the highest court in, uh, in the land here in New York and also the position that oversees uh, the state's $2.4 billion um, unified court system. Corey received her law degree from Harvard Law School and a bachelor's degree in political science and government from the University of Michigan. I'm excited to speak to Corey and hear more about her success. Corey, thanks again for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Roseanne. Let's jump right in. What was your path to becoming an attorney? Did you have any attorneys in your family growing up? What, what, was, what was your path like? Um, I don't have any attorneys in my family still, um, uh, maybe my children, you know, probably not, you know, they, they think that being a lawyer mostly involves being on zoom all day long. So they're not enthusiastic about it at the moment. <laughs> um, but no, I didn't, I didn't have any legal role models in my family. Um, you know, really I'm one of those people where everything I really thought I knew about lawyering was from television shows, uh, growing up. Uh, my path to law school really came, uh, and we're going to go straight to the nerd territory here, uh, through, the, through the path of, of college debate. Uh, I was a competitive college debater, and I was pretty good at that. And it seemed like people who were good at that went to law school and did okay. And, and I didn't really know what to do uh, at the time. Um, I wish I could tell you a, a more coherent or inspirational story, but... Okay. Uh, I was, you know, coming to the end of university to college, like so many people and um, really couldn't really didn't know what I was supposed to be when I grew up still. And so I applied to law school uh, and because I wasn't ready to leave school, I think really is the honest uh, truth at the time. And it turned out to be really lucky for me because I love being a lawyer and it was absolutely the right thing. Uh, But the truth is, I did not know what lawyers really did, even when I applied to law school. That's very interesting. I feel like I also received my education of what lawyers did mainly through watching TV, LA Law, Law and Order. Those are the, the shows on when we were growing up. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but, but it's funny because, of course, those shows are really such a fundamentally, I think, misleading, you know, vision of what really being a lawyer is. And I think it wasn't so much that I thought, oh, you know, I want to be one of those law and order lawyers. It was really more, the truth is I, I went to law school, so I wanted to go to law school, not because I was sure I wanted to be a lawyer. And I was really lucky because I got into Harvard and that was a real accomplishment for me. You know, I went to, I'm from Michigan. I grew up in Michigan. I went to the University of Michigan, which is an amazing school, but was my state school. So it wasn't as if it was like a huge leap of my horizons to, to go there. And, um, you know, getting into Harvard for me was a absolute like life changing experience. And I can't, you know, my mother didn't go to college at all. My, my dad did. But it, it's not I, I don't come from a family where everybody ha- goes to college for sure. We I come from a working class family. We have, you know, um, FedEx delivery drivers, uh, n- you know, nurses and, and professionals and some accountants, but also, you know, blue collar workers, kind of a mix. And so it just wasn't a given and let alone going to some place like that. So when I got in, I thought, well, I definitely want to go to Harvard Law School. Again, thinking about the next step is going to law school, not so much being a lawyer. Uh, but I love to write and I love what legal reasoning is. And, you know, it's that college debater in me. I love kind of tackling a complex issue and trying to see both sides of it and come out with the strongest argument. That whole process is uh, it's, a, it's such a privilege to me to be able to do that professionally. 
No, I mean, for someone who loves school, um, being a lawyer is, is kind of a no-brainer because a lot of times we're still in school every day. You need to learn a new topic. You need to go back and do some research. You need to do some writing. Um, I, th I think uh, similar minds uh, tend to to like law school, practice law as well. So yeah, that's great. Um, and so what was your first job out of law school? You went to law school, weren't sure what it meant to be a lawyer. How did you navigate that? And what was your first job out of law school? Yeah, well, I did the classic thing that if you have the opportunity to do to further extend your um, legal education as opposed to becoming a real lawyer, which is what I clerked uh, um, for an appellate court. So that and and in, by the time I was partway through it, I kind of regretted doing it in the sense that I think that was the year where I was like, OK, no, I'm ready to be a lawyer. And being an appellate clerk is you know, very much like being in law school still, not like being a lawyer. And so by the end of that, I was very hungry to become a real lawyer. Uh, but I did enjoy clerking. I learned a lot clerking and it gave me that time and space to really figure out what to, what I really where I would really go next. And for me, you know, the, being a, a, a social justice lawyer, a public interest lawyer, is really the confluence of two things for me. There, there's all those things we things we've been discussing that I you know really like legal reasoning, I like research, I like writing. And then I've always been an activist as well. I've always been someone who uh, wants to contribute. We lost your audio a little bit there, Corey. Oh, we're back. Are we back? Yep, I think we're back now. Okay, you, uh, okay. you were saying that you have also always been an activist. And yeah, I've always to contribute, I think is what you were saying. Yeah. I, and for me, being an activist was something that was kind of on the side. You know, when I, when I was at in school and university growing up, um, I, I was part of clubs, I was part of movements, we did kind of, you know, marches on campus, um, and organizing on campus, but I didn't really realize that, you know, that could also be my career. So when I was clerking, as I was graduating from law school, uh, I really started to look at jobs and I started to look at jobs where I could be a civil rights lawyer. And I knew from clinical experience in law school and from clerking that I wanted to be a litigator, uh, that that was where, again, those kind of debatey skills, legal reasoning, legal research and writing skills um, mm -hmm. were going to come into play for me. So I started looking at jobs where I could do that. And the first job that I got after clerking was at a small plaintiff side law firm that had a fellowship program called it, at the time it was called Relman and Associates, a, a, a guy named John Relman out of Washington, D.C., who does a lot of federal civil rights litigation. Uh, they're now called Relman, Dane, Colfax. I, I might be missing somebody, but they've grown a lot. They're a great firm. <laughs> and um, and so that was a great opportunity because working in the private bar um, at, has really was was a real uh, trial by fire, getting to know litigation. You know, it's a small firm, you know, not very, you know, cases are staffed very thinly. So I got an opportunity straight away to be doing, you know, things that I think at a big firm, you're going to wait three, five years before you get a chance to do, uh, leading on drafting motions, leading on depositions, right, right out the gate. And that was a really great experience. Um, that was a fellowship, you know, many, many of these entry level, roles in the public interest world are fellowships. So they're kind of one year, mm -hmm. two years, maybe, and then you move on. And so I did move on to another fellowship uh, that time at the ACLU. And um, I was the Carpatkin Fellow there, which is a, a fellowship uh, established to focus on racial justice issues. And, uh, and that was my entry into a 10 year long career um, in the ACLU family. Oh, so that's what brought you to uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union? Yeah. Um, after my clerk, after my fellowship year at ACLU, I ended up staying but moving to the state affiliate of the ACLU. So for those who aren't familiar with the ACLU, it's a national organization, but it's got affiliates in each state, which are uh, affili affiliated, um, but technically separate organizations. But the New York um, Civil Liberties Union and the ACLU are in the same building, you know, very closely uh, related. And um, what I liked about moving to the state affiliate of the ACLU as opposed to the national office at the time was that um, the national office 
very much so now and was already in the process of becoming siloed in it, it, it was growing and it is in fact you know as many people know it has grown immensely even since then especially since the trump administration but even at the time it was growing very fast and so it was settling into issue specific projects where there was when i when i first started there was something called the general legal department of the aclu mm -hmm. and eventually that all went away and if you worked as a lawyer at the american civil liberties union you worked in a project on a single issue so you were either an lgbtq lawyer or a voting rights lawyer or immigrants rights lawyer or free speech and, and privacy lawyer and 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 there wasn't crossover and what i loved about and i still love about the affiliates the state affiliates of the aclu and i really urge people who are thinking about a career to look at their state affiliate or any state affiliate if you're flexible about where you go in the country um, is that they're generalists uh, by and large. And so you get an opportunity to work on a really wide range of civil liberties issues. You can do a free speech case one day, a criminal justice case another day, an immigrants rights case a third day. And that, I, I just found that really intellectually stimulating and interesting. And again, I, I think if there's a theme here, it's like I've never, it, it, having to make choices is really hard for me. And so <laughs> I can keep options open and keep it kind of widespread. It was something I always really wanted to do. And so I spent 10 years there because I, again, it was so, uh, I loved working there. People, the people there were amazing. The quality of the work was incredible. And I never got bored because um, there were so many, you know, if I, if, I, if I got bored doing immigrants, you know, immigration detention cases, I could just, you know, finish up those cases and move on it and do something else uh, as long as it was affecting New Yorkers, which um, so many issues do. So that was a really great experience. Well, yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, and I'm sure as you were there for so long, you were able to move up in seniority and and uh, take on more of a supervisory role. So that, I'm sure that was also very interesting. What, um, what led you to leave um, the New York Civil Liberties Union? Is that when you joined the Department of Justice? Yeah, I went the the next place I went after NICLU was DOJ and that was because I just had you know it was an incredible opportunity to work for Vinita Gupta who at the time was running the civil rights division uh, of um of the Department of Justice and uh, I went there to be her senior counsel. Um senior counsel role is kind of it's a little bit of an ombudsperson role in that your job is to really your job is to do whatever the assistant assistant attorney general wants you to do so you do a lot of um standing in her shoes when she can't be two places at once and exercising her authority or you know representing her and bringing back decisions to her uh, advising her and supporting her to make the wide range of decisions that she has to make uh, undertaking special projects so for example um I oversaw a project where we were trying to assess the impact of, of DOJ's police reform model uh, and develop an evidentiary basis for um, for that model so that it, we could improve it and also validate it. Um, so special projects like that. So it was, it's, it was, again, a really interesting role because it was very fluid, uh, really depends. I think the life of a senior counsel at DOJ is really dependent on what on who you're working for who your print as you say your principal is and what their agenda is because it's not a structural role where it's like you oversee this division it's really you're carrying out the uh, agenda uh and strategic plan of um the principal you know appointee that you're working for so that was a really fun job and gave me a real oversight to how, DO, how the civil rights division works and also how DOJ works more broadly because the other thing you do as senior counsel is really deal, um, you know, manage the civil rights division's relationships with the other components of DOJ and ensure that everybody's working together and communicating together. And if a decision needs to be made where, you know, you can't make that decision unless you're consulting with federal law enforcement or you're consulting with U.S. attorney's offices, you know, you, you have to do that outreach and get people together and do all the things that require to make the federal government move, which is like, you know, to call it a um, aircraft carrier. Uh, and, you know, it would be an understatement. I mean, it takes mm -hmm. a lot of people, a lot of time, a lot of work to get things done. It was a really interesting contrast in that sense, because I went from a relatively small NGO where you know, we could do, I could write a letter threatening to sue some local government in New York, uh, and it would take me, you know, maybe a week to write it and get the approval from, you know, the executive director, the legal director, or whatever it was. Um, 
you know, it, it would take probably, you know, I would say three months minimum to get a letter like that approved out of DOJ. And um, now, of course, that's kind of a function. I think that's not a bad thing, to be honest with you, because it's kind of the old with great power comes great responsibility line. I mean, it, it, the ACLU is an incredible organization, but, you know, it, it doesn't have the same impact that a letter threatening to sue you from the federal government right, has. It's not the federal you know, government. <laughs> yeah, there could be, you know, I mean, bureaucracy gets a really bad rap, but I think bureaucracy is a good thing in the sense that it is a, it is a constraint on power and unchecked power is not such a good thing. So that, you know, it, it, it's, it's a good thing that it requires three months because you really make sure that everybody who needs to think about that issue, think about that decision, gets a chance to weigh in. And, and those folks are going to have important things and perspectives um, to to put into the room. And if you're not accounting for that, you're not doing your job. So it, it was, but it was really different, you know, the kind of nimbleness versus impact, I suppose, ratio was really like inverted. That's a, an interesting perspective uh, to have on it. I don't think most people think about it that way, but um, I think it's right. And it, it's interesting that, you know, that's why sort of these grassroots organizations can have, they can be more um, quicker to react, right, to issues and to highlight issues. But it's probably good that it takes the federal government a little bit longer sometimes, even though it does seem sometimes like justice is delayed and maybe denied because it takes so long for the wheels to turn. Right? Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting that you were, so you were in New York at the, um, New York Civil Liberties Union. Did you have to move to DC for the job at the DOJ? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, and how does that uh, was that disruptive at all to your your personal life as well? And how did you balance that? Yeah, um, it was a crazy time, Roseanne. I have to tell you, uh, I had two kids under the age of three at the time. <laughs> or I was doing the math. Was I'm like, I think her kids were really young at that time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, on top of that my husband is british and works for the british government uh -huh. and he was on an assignment in london at the time so we not not only so we were going to leave new york anyway because because of that um but rather than all moving to london um or, or all moving to washington we tried to that basically shared single parent our children um, for about a year and a half, a little a little less than that. I mean, it was I, I don't recommend this. Can I can I share as a lesson? I mean, I, I don't have any regrets because I had an amazing experience. He had an amazing experience professionally. Our kids are fine. Um, it all worked out, but it was a really intense period. And, you know, we did it. You know, again, they were not in school yet. And, you know, kids that young are so flexible which is a good thing. I think it actually would be impossible to do that now at the age of my kids and your kids are out where they're kind of, you know, between, yeah. you know, you know, seven and, and 14 years old or whatever, but because um, they, you know, then they start to have their own interests and kind of stability becomes really important to them. Yeah. But at the young age that my kids were at, it, it, it didn't, that didn't matter as much and they, they were fine, but um, it was, it was me who was <laughs> less fun because it went from one extreme of like, I have a FaceTime relationship with my kids for a couple of months, you know, to the other extreme of, you know, I'm, I'm basically trying to do this, trying to have this really high powered job and do this by myself. And, um, you know, I had a little bit of help, you know, you can't, I don't think anybody can do this totally by themselves. So um, two days a week, maybe in two or three days a week, it depended on the week, I had someone else pick them up from daycare and take them home and feed them and put them to bed. Uh, and then the other days a week, I would do it and I would, um, uh, they were in a daycare right across the street from my office. Uh, I was in the main justice building and they were in the IRS building right across the street. And I'd just go get them at five o'clock, drive home with them in the car, like try to feed them and bathe them as quickly as I could, put them to bed and then come back and work another few hours from like, you know, 730 until like whenever. And so so people just knew that between about five and seven, 730, um, that I was just like might not be available, uh, which wasn't easy because, you know, the other, one thing about being senior counsel to the assistant attorney general, it's a very high powered job. It sounds really important, but you're like working for this person who's way more important than you. And now, fortunately, I was working for an amazing high powered person, Benita Gupta, who's like an incredible person, a mother herself. Like she was, I couldn't have asked for a better, more understanding principal, you know, high power person to be working for in that respect. But um, it was, it was, it was manic. <laughs> that sounds very intense. <laughs> yeah. 
did you then send the kids for part of the months to the UK or? Yeah. So oh, wow. we, we knew what the, what the, what we decided was, you know, I came in at the end of the Obama administration. So that administration was going to end. And so I was going to leave at the end of the administration as everybody does. Right. So I mean, some people might, if, if, I mean, the election didn't go this way, but if, if, if Hillary Clinton had won the election, maybe some people would have tried to stay, but I wasn't going to do that. I was just going to do this, have this experience and then go to London, which is what I did do. Um, so we, so the kids were with me at first and then the kids went ahead to London and then that, that's when I had a little bit of breathing space. Although um, it was a very weird time and kind of a sad time to be alone, especially after the election, because, you know, um, everybody then knew that, that, uh, that President Trump had won the election. And so a lot of, we knew that a lot of the things that we'd worked on in the Obama administration might not, you know, be around much longer, which is, you know, of course, at some level, a kind of dispiriting thing and the mood of the country or the mood of Washington uh, an Obama administration, Washington, um, you know, it was not the happiest place. Uh, I have a lot of great friends there and that was great, but I really, I was ready to go be with my family. Yeah, um, for sure. All over. A lot of people threatened to leave the country after Trump won, but you actually had the opportunity to do so. <laughs> I did, although I wasn't, I wasn't trying to flee, really. I, was, I wasn't actually one of those people who was like, oh, I have to leave the country because of this, you know, I, at all. But um, like I said, if it had been a Hillary Clinton administration, I would have been fleeing the country as well. So <laughs> it was just, you know, it was what it was. <laughs> so you went to um, the UK and you were working um, at an organization called Liberty. Can you tell us a little bit about that and your experience there? Yeah, um, Liberty is, it really, I mean, I think to an American audience, I often say it is like the ACLU of the UK. Um, it, uh, very similar, uh, similar kind of orientation. It's a civil liberties organization. Um, it was founded around the same time as the ACLU in the in the 19 teens and 20s. Um, you know, the ACLU was founded after the Palmer raids as a kind of reaction to the Palmer raids. Liberty was founded as a reaction to um, the police crackdown on the hunger on hunger strikes in the city of London, a very brutal police crackdown. And so both motivated by um, concerns about uh, the abuse of state power in, uh, you know, a kind of an era that was leading into um, World War II and, and the rise of fascism across Europe and kind of that whole environment. And so very similar political orientation, similar approach of kind of a mix of li impact litigation and um, policy work and legal research and policy development and expertise on those kinds of topics, working on a, a range of civil rights and civil liberties issues. And so it felt very comfortable on the one hand because the kind of whole ethos and approach was similar to what I had done for 10 years in America, but also really different because it's an entirely different legal system. And um, as advocacy director, and then of course as the acting director, part of my job is to oversee a team of lawyers. And I was not a UK lawyer. I, I, I'm still not admitted to the bar in the UK. I, I, um, so I had to kind of learn um, the UK legal system enough to kind of give strategic guidance and oversight to that team. And also, you know, frankly, uh, gain credibility, you know, because here I had a team of lawyers who were like, you're not even a lawyer. What are you, why are you our boss? Um, and, you know, fortunately over time, um, you know, he, you know, we, 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 we came to a place of uh, mutual respect, but it was a kind of, an, I was an unusual person to have that job in that sense. Uh, but it was really great. You know, when we worked on issues relating to the Met police, which is similar to the issues, you know, I worked a lot of police issues at DOJ and I do that here at Legal Aid now. Uh, we worked on a lot of privacy technology issues, uh, including, um, you know, the UK uh, has a very expansive uh, statutory regime for surveillance and warrants and eavesdropping, electronic warrants. Um, and there's been a lot of discourse and debate back and forth uh, in the last 20 years, really, about the line between privacy and state power surveillance and really being on the cutting edge of that uh, in the UK was a really interesting uh, really interesting job to have. Oh, huh, sounds fascinating. Um, and then you moved back to the States, was it in 2019? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was 2019. And then I started Legal Aid in, in January 2020. So it was like right before the pandemic. <laughs> so it was a very interesting time to be starting a job. <laughs> and, uh, and what made you go to the Legal Aid Society? Because, you know, from where you were before? 
what brought you to there? Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to, I, I had worked at these big national organizations. You know, I'd worked at DOJ, I'd worked at Liberty, which is a national organization. And um, although the New York Civil Liberties Union is state, statewide focus, you know, ACLU has a very national outlook. And I really wanted to work more in my own community. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and focus a little bit more on New York City, which I've always I've always felt like a New Yorker. I mean, I'm from I grew up in Michigan, but I've lived in New York City more than I've lived in Michigan more than I lived any other place. And I I really wanted I really always admired the Legal Aid Society because it's huge and its impact is just uh, incredible and um, unlock you know it has this incredible model of being a public defender, being this you know the city's primary public defender as well as you know civil legal services provider but also engaging in the systemic issues that affect its its direct services clients and i really thought and and I, this has turned out to be 100% true that it would be a really great model to do the kind of work that i did at the new york civil liberties union and doj and liberty but connected deeply to the work of a direct services provider and mm -hmm. and the reason is that one of the things that kind of impact litigation and big national kind of big picture policy advocacy organizations um, struggle with is being grounded in impacted individuals. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what you see a lot of these big organizations is um, the agenda is driven by uh, a very educated, very uh, legally and technically and policy expert uh, people who are really smart, but um, tend not to be from the communities that are directly impacted by the policies that they're litigating or advocating for. And, um, and in fact, you know, tend to be somewhat removed from those um, communities. And, you know, various organizations do various things to try to engage communities to have uh, advisory boards or to engage organizers to connect with their work, but it's, um, it's a real challenge. And, we don't have i mean we, we still of course we're still conscious of that but being at a direct legal services provider is an amazing way to address that issue because i don't have to work very hard to know what's happening on the ground when it comes to criminal legal issues in new york city or what's happening with um what it's like to be homeless uh, are unhoused on the streets of New York City because we have our, our practitioners, our lawyers are out there every day um, helping and assisting and supporting clients who are experiencing the criminal legal system who are experiencing homelessness. And um, that's an incredible resource. And uh, I think that the work that we do at Legal Aid to try to address the systemic issues, the, the impact litigation work, the policy advocacy work is so much stronger because of that direct connection to direct legal services and, and, and there to, to the clients, the impacted people. Yeah, and it must have been, a, you mentioned you started there right before COVID. It must have been a, a really, um, I don't want to say interesting experience, but it must have been very eye-opening to be there during the, the pandemic and seeing um, really the effect on on so many, and especially um, poor and minorities, more um, even more impacted by the COVID pandemic, um, especially early on, um, yeah. and, and having to address that situation as a legal aid provider. Yeah, absolutely, and and it was really um intense because i you know i started and you know in january february having all these conversations about you know a strategic plan and what, what were we going to focus on and what 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 areas are we going to grow in and and develop new lines of work in and then the pandemic happened and a hundred percent of our attention um shifted to two things really one as a kind of uh administrative but incredibly important matters how do we work i mean how do we continue to do what we were doing in in, in this new world of covid and, and you know legal aid is 2000 plus employees and shifting our model of work to remote um dealing with technology issues that as a underfunded public defender organization we were not well resourced uh, on to begin with um, that was an enormous challenge but then really more importantly was COVID's impact on our uh, client communities. And where the hardest, sharpest edge of that was our incarcerated clients. 
And we immediately uh, saw with, you know, the one thing, so much was unclear, if you remember back that, at that time in March yeah. and April 2020, like nobody really knew what, how this disease worked, how it spread, how it was going to get controlled. But the one thing that everybody knew really early on and turned out to be 100% true is that congregate settings were dangerous, the most dangerous. And there is no more congregate setting than jail uh, and Rikers Island which is uh, overcrowded and dilapidated and unsanitary on the best of days. Yeah. And we knew that our clients who were incarcerated were at risk of, uh, of disease and death. And um, we moved very quickly to you know, raise alarm bells first. And then when those alarm bells were not responded to, to litigate, to try to get as many people as we could out of jail as possible. And um, in the end, you know, it, it, over the period of I, you know, I, I'm gonna, I don't, I don't want, I'm a little bit. Um, it's been a while since I look at the data, but let's just to, to conservatively over a you know eight to ten week period, the population of Rikers fell by over a third, uh, which is really a lot of decarceration. That's a and, lot of the Rikers. <laughs> yeah, and some of that was a result of litigation that we filed. Some of it was a result of collaboration. You know, we we are always an organization that, uh, with one hand, we are suing uh, the state of New York and the city of New York, and with the other hand, we are holding hands and trying to work together with state and city officials. And we did both. We sued them uh, and won uh, some of them, lost some of them, uh, but we also worked with the state and city to try to persuade and 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 collaborate. And that was successful in a lot of cases of just trying to identify people who were sick identify people who maybe just didn't have to be there, uh, that everybody could agree didn't have to be there and try to get as many people out as we could. And I think we did save a lot of lives that way. I, I think we could have saved more, um, but that was, it was just really important to be focusing on that. And that that really kind of was almost through 2020, really you know, what we did with most of our time as a team. That's a, a very challenging environment to come into back from, from overseas. Yeah. Um, so you are the attorney in charge of special litigation. What does that mean specifically? Your what your what is your role at the organization? Yeah, um, my, you know, I oversee the part of legal aid on the criminal defense side that tries to address the systemic issues that face our public defense clients. So we. I have two teams, or two, we have two functions really, litigation and policy work. And really I would add a third one, which is community organizing, which kind of connects to both of those. And I, I oversee a team of lawyers, policy experts, um, legal professionals and community organizers who um, look at those systemic problems and try to solve them. And sometimes the solutions involve passing new legislation, Sometimes it involves agency advocacy, that kind of like trying to collaborate side of things where we reach out to whether it's the Department of Correction or the NYPD or the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice or whoever it is and try to work on making policy or practice a bit better. And sometimes it's suing. Um, and so we look at a problem. We try to look at a problem, the problems facing our clients, which we learn about from our frontline public defenders and from our community partners uh, who we connect with every day in, in all five boroughs. And we try to figure out what the right solution or the best solution might be. And sometimes, you know, some, some problems are more susceptible to collaboration and change and some problems really just need to be litigated. Um, and we try to think about that smartly. Uh, and, um, but we bring, we'll bring any tool to bear that we can to try to make things better for our client community. That's interesting. It seems like you get to use sort of two sides of your brain every day. So. Oh. Yeah, and it's it's funny because like I think, you know, um, just being honest uh, for a minute, I think I sometimes wonder. I, I'm not I, I'm not a typical. You know, I I have not the the the, the, the mentality of, of public defenders is very um, uh, aggressive. You know, everything is a battle. And I think, it, and, and that makes sense. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be critical of that at all. I think that's as it should be, because I think to go into court 
uh, on behalf of clients where the entire power of the state is being brought to bear to take away their fundamental liberty, you really do have to be a warrior for that client. That's what that client needs in that moment. That's what due process needs. That's our whole system is that's it's the most it is the adversarial is the most adversarial edge of our adversarial system. And for good reason, because we have to test the prosecution's case, before, you know, so they um, so that we don't end up having wrongful convictions and injustice. But um, I think that's not actually my natural state as a, mm -hmm. as a person. And but I think that it's a good mix because I think I'm constantly being checked and challenged by my colleagues, my public defender colleagues, uh, um, about whether I'm being too collaborative or whether I'm not pushing hard enough. And I think I think I like to think that I'm checking them too and saying, well, you know, we could go to war, but is that going to deliver for our client faster or more in a more durable way than if we actually tried to get people in a room, get them aligned? And is it worth trying that? And I think that that dialogue is. Um, I think really healthy and, mm -hmm. and I think produces pretty good outcomes. It's interesting. So I also mentioned earlier that you are on the short list of nominees to serve as chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals, which is um, obviously the highest court in New York State. Um, to the extent you can discuss it, I know it's still an open issue because they still haven't chosen someone for the role. Um, how has it been to navigate um, that, that experience of just being considered for such an important role um, in our justice system. Yeah, well, I, for, it's such an honor. It's really incredible to be doing it because when I graduated from law school, um, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, I didn't really have a great sense. You know, I didn't I didn't have a map of the legal community um, or a plan for my career. I, I, I couldn't even I, I couldn't make a plan because I didn't have the map. I just didn't really know how you get from point A to point B in the legal world at the time. And um, I, I thought I wanted to be a judge. I always wanted to be a judge. As soon as I figured out what they really did, I thought that sounds like a dream job. But I inherited an understanding when I graduated from law school that I had to choose between doing public service and civil rights work which I was very passionate about doing and serving, you know, causes that advance racial justice and economic justice and all, all of that on the one hand versus the kind of more established paths to becoming a judge. And, you know, I made a choice, which I, at the time I thought I was leaving behind uh, any shot or dream of becoming a judge. Mm -hmm. And I think really the conversation that was started by the Biden administration um, and many people who pushed the Biden administration to diversify the professional backgrounds of people on the bench has really um, revealed that choice that I thought I'd made to be a false choice and really opened up for people who built a career in public interest the opportunity to be on the bench. And I think that's incredibly exciting. And I think the fact that I made it onto the short list demonstrates that that is real. This is this is not, you know, and I mean, you, you, and, and looking at the people who are getting nominated, obviously, to the federal bench, too, we, there's evidence all around us that you can have a successful career as a civil rights advocate, as someone who really is pushing for social and economic justice, uh, and still um, have the opportunity to serve the country as, as in the judiciary. And I, and so I, I'm really proud to have been on the list. Uh, to help send that signal that like this isn't a this is an available avenue. Um, you know, a, in addition to all the federal judge, you know, I really urge people to think about state courts. State courts are incredibly important. Um, just generally, they always have been. But now, I think, given where we are as a country and what's happening with the United States Supreme Court, um, state courts are more important than ever before when it comes to issues of um, constitutional rights and social justice. And, you know, whether it's abortion issues or gun control issues, state courts are going to be deciding issues that uh, really go to the heart of um, civil rights and uh, the functioning of our democracy. And so I, I, I really I, I hope that maybe I would actually be a judge one day. But even if I don't make it onto the court, uh, I hope that the fact that I've made it on the list will inspire others to try. And if there's anybody out there who wants to um, talk about the process, I'm very available to anybody, you know, who wants advice on how you get through. I, I, I think the top lines that I would say are first, you have to apply. I mean, I think I, I didn't know this, but but and I think a lot of people don't know this, but you, nobody just taps you on the shoulder. This is, <laughs> this is true for the federal positions as well. 
you don't, you don't, you know, if you just are waiting around until someone you think, oh, I'm important enough that someone's going to ask me to be a judge, you will, it will never happen. There is an application process like for any other job and you just apply. And I think you might be surprised if you apply how far you can get. But once you do apply it, I think it is true. You kind of have to, um, you know, you, you have to lobby for it. I mean, you, you're not supposed to say that because it's not, it's, you know, it's not, um, it's uncouth to call it lobbying because it makes it seem so political. But the reality is that you will be, you probably will be qualified. I mean, um, but there are a lot of people who are really qualified and mm -hmm. you need um, to kind of stand up above the crowd. And so it really does require quite a lot of work mm -hmm. to figure out how do I make it clear to the people who are deciding that I'm, I'm I, I, you know, I'm the right person for this. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, yeah, I would say that. But I don't want to deter people from it because it, um, it is possible and it's and you don't have to be like super connected and the world's best network worker. I am neither of those things, um, but it, it is it is you have to really want it like it's not something you kind of do casually. Right. Um, so but but really, I, I, I I'm happy to demystify the process to anybody who's interested in, in finding out more because we really need more people from those backgrounds to be applying for those, those roles. That's a wonderful offer. And I do hope some people take you up on that. That is, uh, I know it's a very, uh, even the process for uh, joining the judiciary on the trial court level, you know, in New York state, it's an election, but you have to apply. There's a whole political process you have to go through to even get on the ballot. I have a good friend who's, who's in the process of doing it right now. And I previously served on one of the committees because of the I'm in a bar, local bar association I'm a member of, and it's a very thorough process of vetting that goes on before the election even, before you even get your name on the ballot, right? So um, it's a very yeah. interesting process. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's great that, uh, you know, you should apply if you're interested and definitely, um, you know, we need to broaden the base. I, I think that this idea that you have to be, you know, a, a private, a lawyer in private practice at like a big firm to be a judge doesn't make a lot of sense because most lawyers and most um, are not that right. And most people right. that are in the justice system don't have that background. And so you want people that have diverse range of experience to be able to provide justice for um, a society that is diverse, right? So absolutely. That's correct. Diversity is important in every every field, <laughs> including the law. I think we're always the last ones to to be diverse <laughs> at all, but we try. Um, okay, so you've made a lot of decisions throughout your career, um, a lot of movement from one job to the other, um, and a very diverse career path. How have you made those decisions? Have you relied on certain people to for advice? Have you kept your own counsel? How did you navigate that process? Yeah, I don't have a process. I mean, for, for career decisions. I mean, I think I have a process for decisions, decisions. But, um, you know, when it comes to my career, I think I have been pretty relaxed and it has worked out well, which is not, a, that's not a very satisfying answer to that question, but it's like the honest answer to that question. Um, with the exception, I will say, of, of, again, to trying to be a judge, where like you have to really, I had to really think about that. You know, you have to consider when you're, especially because obviously becoming a judge is a real, would be a real shift for me because I'm an advocate and being a judge is not about being an advocate at all. And uh, I'm an advocate and a lawyer, and it really would represent, you know, leaving behind advocacy and just fully, uh, you know, leaning into the legal, what I love about legal analysis and the way our judicial system works. And, you know, that, I, I, I'm very clear that I want to do it. You know, I wouldn't be trying to do this if I if I didn't. But it's you know that required a lot of thought, and I talked to a lot of people who are judges about that shift, and a lot, especially a lot of the you know my my colleagues in this world who are moving into the federal judiciary, and um, you know just to get, make sure I knew what I would be getting into, and I think that I do. So I do think it helps to go and find people who have done it or are doing it to make sure that you, you know, have all the information that you need to make the decision. But at the end of the day, you know, 
it comes down to what feels right. You know, I, I always tell when, when law students ask me or even young lawyers ask me for advice and I taught law school for a really long time. So I, I feel like I gave this advice every year, every semester. It's, I, I taught a clinic too. So I, I taught law students who wanted to make an impact. You know, they, these were students who kind of naturally, they, what they wanted to do was go out and they had always asked me this question, like, how can I have the greatest impact? And I would always say that's the wrong question because when you ask that question, what you're asking is what kind of lawyer is the most impactful lawyer? And the answer to that is you're the most impactful lawyer when you're doing what you love. Because you can say, oh, you know, what you really need to do is you need to do death penalty work because, you know, that's what everything's on the line. You know, that's the most high impact thing. Or you can say, no, what you really need to do is immigrants rights work because what, you know, what people are doing to people who are coming to rest the border, you know, that's where you see, you know, children separated from families. Or you could say, oh, no, what you really need to do is be a public defender because, you know, the churn of the criminal legal system affects so many people. Or you could say, no, what you really need to be is, and you could go on and on with all of the things that you could do to try to help people who don't have access to justice and the answer is you you should do whatever you will be happiest doing because you will be the best at it if you are happy doing it and then you will deliver the most for your clients for communities and for the world and for the law and so figure out what makes you happy do you like to write really long briefs then go be an impact litigator yeah you like to get out there into the community, then go be a community organizer, which a lot of lawyers now, you know, do. Do you like to, do you like legislation? Do you like kind of going out and kind of trying to move 5,000 million pieces to get everybody all across the finish line to get a, you know, piece of legislation passed? Be a policy person, you know, there's, because you, when in you are doing what you love, then you will be the most impactful. And there's no formula for social change. All of these things have to happen. We need all, we need people doing all of them. So that's kind of what I did is I just thought, what do I love, you know? And at the end of the day, I really love to write. I really love to research and read the law. And I love it when there's a good clash. Like, I, you know, nothing makes me happier in a case than when it's, than when it's a hard argument, you know? Mm -hmm. um, when it's, there's something interesting going on, there's some friction, you know? And, and I think that's kind of why I wanted to move into being a judge because, you know, there you have the opportunity to hear you know, the two different sides on the issue, battle it out and, and, and try to figure out the way forward. And I think that's thrilling. Was there anyone who encouraged you um, to apply for the judgeship? Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, and I, th I think it's right that I, you need those nudges, right? You need yeah. those nudges. It's especially, I think, given where we have been around the discourse around being a judge, you know, um, and it's a big deal, right? I think I, I, everybody has that moment of like, well, could I really do this? Mm -hmm. uh, and then you need people saying, I think you could, you know, to, to really get get you to do it. And and I did have a number of people who were like, look, I, you know, I think you could do this. I think this, this would be good for you. And I think it's because people who know me really well, I think, do think that I have a sort of judicial temperament. And in fact, I sometimes, you know, sometimes, um, some, sometimes the lawyers who work for me actually find it quite annoying, you know, because one of my one of my jobs in the role that I'm in now and, and in some other places is to decide, are we going to bring a case or not? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I can be quite tough. Uh, you know, I part of my job is to protect our resources. You know, we have limited resources and. Um, we, we don't have the resources to make mistakes or bring bad, bad cases uh, or bring weak cases. And so I can be quite tough. And, you know, I have more than once I've had people like, oh, you know, I want to bring this case. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not sure that. Mm, what about this? What about that? Uh, and I've had, you know, lawyers say to me, well, you're not the, we're not you're acting like you're the judge. I'm like, well, yeah, right. Because it's you know, we have to test whether this is a good use of our resources for our clients. And. Right. Um, so I think, you know, just seeing that, you know, co colleagues seeing the way that I approach legal issues, you know, did make people say, you know what, well, you should think about this. And, and, you know, again, like I said, I, I'd always wanted to do it, but it was just something I thought I left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that little nudge, you know, from your colleagues can really, really help. Well, I think it's great. I think the judiciary would be um, lucky to have you join the, their ranks. So I'm excited to see what happens 
next there. Um, we've talked a lot about all of the sort of legal work you've done throughout your career and the, the way you've used your law degree to, to both be an advocate and also uh, to help shape policy. What do you value the most sort of about your experience going to law school and the training that you received there, and sort of how you carry it into your life? Um, you know, I, I actually love, you know, people say about law school that, um, law school doesn't teach you the law. It teaches you to think like a lawyer. Uh, and in fact, I sometimes hear people saying that as if that's a pejorative thing. I actually think that's great about law school. And, and that's what I appreciated about law school was that law school gave me the tools to ask the right questions about the law and not to and, and to filter out instinct and outcome determinative thinking um, and bias and try to figure out what the law is. And I think, you know, as an advocate, you know, and as an advocate, we are very outcome determined and, you know, we want to get to a certain place. But but I think what lawyers, the one of the values that lawyers bring even to advocacy movements that are outcome determinative is helping people think through is two things. One is helping people think through um, unintended consequences. Like if you bring this case and argue in that way, that might seem like a very powerful argument for your client. But the thing is, it's going to actually result in this for these other folks you also represent or care about or da or down the road. It's going to result in this change to policy, which actually is going to redound to you know, the client's disadvantage down the road and kind of being able to think objectively mm -hmm. in order to see it, the whole picture and, and get to better outcomes even, or you know, at least see the right, see fully the outcomes. I think kind of outcome determinative thinking can, can blind, put, put blinders on to what you know, the real out, world outcomes will, will actually be. Um, but the other thing is to test, again, that testing function of you know, are we doing the right? Are we making the strongest argument that we could? Are we thinking through what the other side's going to say? And are we ready for what they're going to say? And um, I think the ability to do all that is what law school trains people to do when we say, you know, law school trains people to think, think like lawyers. I, I mean, I agree with all of that. I think that law school is a, it's a great way of learning to think, not just sort of in your day to day practice, but also learning critical thinking skills that a lot of people don't seem to have. <laughs> and it's very different from a lot of the way the rest of the world uh, thinks about issues. And I think it, it really is valuable. Um, I always find it interesting. Some people say that they love law school, that they hate practicing or that they um, hated law school, but love practicing. I really loved law school and I really enjoy practicing. I'm wondering how you feel about that as well. Same. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I loved both. I loved, lo I mean, you know, I went to a law school that wasn't always easy to, I mean, I mean, obviously it wasn't easy, but it wasn't even always an easy place to be um, in that, you know, I knew that I wanted to do public interest work and that put me in a very small minority at my law school. But um, I learned a lot from all kinds of people at the law school. And also, you know, Harvard is very big. So even though even though the public interest part, um, and I, I don't know if it's still this way or not really, but assuming that it is, even if it's small, it's still a lot of people. And those people, by the way, those people are still my friends, you know, <laughs> they're, the, they're the ones I still talk to the most. And, um, and so I really, that there is that sense of community that I did develop in law school too, even though um, my community was kind of proportionally small, I think, at that school. Um, and also like, I got, you know, I hate to be transactional about it, but it doesn't matter, but the, the, the networks, I mean, the, you know, we have to be clear eyed about this. It is true that going to the, you know, Harvard, or I'm sure this is true of Yale and Stanford and other places, delivers to people networks that have been, I mean, I'm 40 something in my late forties now, you know, I, the, and you know, the, the becoming a judge, all of that, those networks have helped. And yeah. I think that's important to people, for people who are considering, who have, have the opportunity to go to consider that and consider the value of it. But it's also important for us to think about from a, a equity perspective, because um, I think we do, and, I, and I've tried to do this, um, need to think about how young lawyers, students and young lawyers, graduates 
who aren't from those schools have a really difficult time sometimes breaking in. Um, and this is very true in the civil rights litigation world. You know, that I came up through these fellowships that are competitive to get. And you look at who gets those fellowships and it's very disproportionately from like about five different schools. And, you know, so we try to think, you know, at Legal Aid um, and at other places, we try to think about ensuring that we're not just hiring people from those places because there is an equity issue there. But if we don't talk about it, be honest about it, then we won't see it. Yeah. And it's the same issue in the federal judiciary, right? I mean, a lot of the um, judicial clerkships go to very similar schools. There's been this whole discussion with Yale, Harvard, and and a few of the others. Um, it's it's interesting to see. I, you know, I went to uh, big law out of Boston University. I was lucky enough that I was in Boston. And I went to Ropes and Gray, where um, you know they do take some BU students. Uh, but they also take mostly Harvard, Yale, you know, mm -hmm. instead of the same top five. Um, but it was a great opportunity to expand my network, um, you know, and I still have those friends and those colleagues um, yeah. who went to those other schools as well. So um, I think that, you know, equity is very something to make sure that we do keep in, in mind as well. So it's important. I know you have to run uh, to a, another meeting. So I just wanted to finish up with our last three questions. These are usually the rapid fire questions. Okay. Um, so if you couldn't be an attorney or go to law school, what career would you um, choose? Oh God, I'm one of those people that like, honestly, I have no idea and I'm gonna say something stupid. Like I like to garden, I like to cook, you know, but those are definitely my hobbies. I don't, I don't I'm like, I'm terrible. I'd be a lawyer. I, I don't have a I don't know. I'm a very one dimensional person. I doubt that's true. <laughs> what is the one thing you wish you knew in law school or when you graduate law school that you know now? Or something in um, graduates. That it's all going to be okay. <laughs> what? That it's all going to be okay. Okay. I don't know. Um, I think. I I I wish I knew how important the people I met in law school would be to me later on, and I wish I'd done more while I was there and after I left to keep. My law school friendships and relationships going. That's, that's great advice. And um, would you recommend a law career to women considering law school in particular? Because I know sometimes, you know, um, sort of law gets a bad rap for women um, as a profession to go into. And I disagree with that. I think it's actually a great career for women, but I'm wondering your thoughts. Yeah, I think it's a great career for women too. I mean, misogyny <laughs> and patriarchy is everywhere. I mean, it's not like, of course, it's in the law, but it's everywhere. Uh, and what better place to fight it than in the law? I, I So I un, unreservedly recommend uh, a legal career to women, unreservedly. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been fabulous. Um, and I do know you have a meeting to run to. So thank you so much, Corey, for joining us today. Thanks, Suzanne. You've been listening to Success in Brief with your host, Roseanne Felicello. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and sharing the show with others. You can catch prior episodes at www.felicellolaw.com and on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more.